among the many inexplicable mysteries in history, one of the most enigmatic is how a vast multitude of people behaves when Satan is released from the abyss after a thousand years. We talked about this last week. But there has been, during the millennium, peace on earth, joy unimaginable, a world of hope, justice, and righteousness for 1,000 years. Jesus Christ rules and reigns on earth. The Garden of Eden has been restored. There's been no lies, no political wranglings or shenanigans, almost no crime, no poverty, no hunger, no natural disasters. The world has been fruitful and multiplied, as Jesus said, as God said we should back in Genesis. And we filled the earth, and it is now free from the curse of sin. The, the millennium is going to be a wonderful time, not because... God says we have to. It's just going to be that wonderful that when Jesus Christ rules on earth and the curse of sin is lifted. And then at the end of this time, the passage I read earlier says that Satan will be released at the end of the millennium and he will go about deceiving and a multitude of people. It says more than the sands on the seashore people who have been born and raised under the benevolent rule of Christ will demonstrate that their hearts are still mired in sin. They have conformed outwardly to the rule of Christ. They've not been outwardly rebellion, but their hearts are still hardened against Him. They never trusted Christ. People born during the millennium still have to put their faith in Jesus Christ and many millions of people never did. So when Satan is released, they throw off the cloak and they align themselves with the prince of darkness grim. Satan then raises an army that numbers as the sand on the seashore and multiple millions of people decide that Satan's lies are better than God's truth that darkness is better than light. And this desperate wickedness of the human heart is put on full display. And this army of Satan filled with human beings that have tasted of the goodness of God march against the headquarters of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. This final war, like other battles, is over quickly. It's no real war. It says that fire descends from heaven and the rebels are consumed. Because you can fight against Jesus, you can oppose Jesus, but you can never defeat him. Amen. Satan is captured, and in a moment of glorious victory, he is cast into the lake of fire once and for all. His days are done. The tempter, the liar, the dragon, the serpent is cast into the lake of fire, never to be heard from again, and it is our final chance in history to sing that great hymn. What is it? Na, 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 hey, 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 goodbye. And he is gone, folks. He's done. That is it for Satan. You will never hear. When, when he was cast into the abyss, at the beginning of the millennium, he was imprisoned for a thousand years. Now he's done. He's gone. He is done for good. Someone pointed out that the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two chapters of the Bible have something in common. You know what it is? No devil, no Satan. That's exactly right. The serpent doesn't appear until Genesis 3 when he tries to usurp the glory of God. And the serpent is gone. The devil is gone. Dismissed in Revelation 20. When God wraps up this world in His glory, and after that He is nowhere to be found because Jesus is Lord. Now this is the final step. I said there were seven steps in Revelation 19 and 20. There were seven steps. This is step six. The final battle, step six. 
in the process of wrapping up the world in Revelation 19 and 20, the final step is the one we're going to spend most of our time today talking about. That is the great white throne judgment. We talked some about this final battle, and I've mentioned it again today, but I want to focus in today on the great white throne judgment that brings the world to an end. When you come to Revelation 20, 11 through 15, the great white throne, you stand at the very end of time for this wretched, rebellious world. And we come to the end of a very lengthy end times program. Now, I'm not an amillennialist, but amillennialism has a very appealing simplicity to its end time system. In amillennialism, Jesus returns, everybody is judged, and then those who know Jesus go to heaven, those who do not go to eternal hell. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches, but it is far less complicated than the system I believe, which is the rapture, the tribulation, a series of resurrections and judgments that's so complicated, that's why we need all those charts and graphs and all those things that you sometimes see that people make fun of. Uh, but what we all agree on is that when you come to the great white throne, when the last of humanity is judged, the lost are condemned to the lake of fire, and the world has come to a complete and final end, making way for the new heaven and the new earth, where the redeemed of the Lord will enjoy the presence of God for all eternity. This is the end. The great white throne is the end of this wicked world that we have lived in. Now I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask you, when I answer the question, in a way that will surprise you, I'm going to ask you not to throw anything at me. <clears throat> and I want you to give me a chance to explain my answer before you storm out or call me a heretic, okay? Because in the end, my answer is going to, I think, satisfy you that perhaps I am not a bold heretic violating the Word of God. Here's the question. How many ways are there for people to be saved? I see a lot of ones out there. One way to be saved. Each of us good church folks, us good Baptists, know that there's only one way to be saved. I would like to advance the idea which I believe the Bible teaches, and this passage especially teaches, that there are two ways to be saved. <laughs> now the problem is, none of us can handle the first method. And so only one way is left. Let me explain what I mean. Do not pick up stones to stone me until I've finished my point. Revelation 20, verses 11, 15, 11 through 15, picks up, speaks of two sets of books that are kept in heaven. And I believe these books speak of two ways that you can be saved. If you want to spend eternity in heaven, you got to pass the test set forward by one set of books or the other. Both of these books are mentioned in verse 12, and they're developed throughout this passage. The first set of books is a book of works. All of your works are recorded in that book. It says repeatedly in this passage, you will be judged by what you have done. You will be judged according to the things that you have done, according to your works not only will you be judged by your works but you'll be judged by your words and your thoughts the bible makes it clear jesus himself made it clear that when god judges you it's not just by your outward works but by the words that you've said and even the thoughts and intents of your heart remember when jesus said that it's not enough not just to commit adultery but if you've 
committed lust in your heart that you, well, that changes everything, doesn't it? So, when a person stands before the throne, the great white throne for judgment, the first criterion will be their works. Are you good enough to get into heaven? So the question is, how good do you have to be? Do you just have, does God grade on a curve? Do you just have to be better than average? Better than other people? Romans 3, 23 spells it out. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The standard is the glory of God, the perfection of Jesus Christ. Revelation later tells us that no sin can enter the presence of God in eternity. Now let's play pretend. Let's just pretend that Jackie here has lived her entire life sinless and perfect, except for one time when Dale aggravated her. <laughs> and she lost her temper. Just one time, she lost her temper. And just that one time. And said some unkind things to him. Just that one time in her whole life, just that one time, one slip up in her 39 years. Yeah, right. <laughs> Bob wants to come live at your house. If I... No. I said we're playing pretend, folks. This is pretend. If Jackie could live a perfect life Except for one slip-up, guess what? She has sinned and fallen short of the glory. Now listen, we don't live one perfect day, much less a perfect life with one slip-up. We don't live a perfect hour without a slip-up. But if she could, one slip-up is enough to fall short of the glory of God. No sin can enter the presence of God. And all you have to do, all you have to do to reach eternal life this way is to be sinless from the moment your life begins until the day that you die. No sins, not a single negative mark. Now, who wants to try it? Who wants to stand before God and say, I have never committed a sin? Yeah, I'm not trying that one. I have never thought an angry, evil, wicked, sinful thought. God can allow no sin into heaven, and we are all sinners. Not a single human being who has ever lived will pass the test. Judged by the first book, we are all guilty. We will, that's why we say there's only one way to heaven. There's technically two ways to heaven if we could, if, if we could do it. If we could pass the test and live perfectly, there is, in fact, there was one person who passed the test. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin and lived a sinless life. In his thoughts, in his words, and in his actions, he committed not one sin, not one mark in his book. Spotless. Right, you know, there have been so many people recently studies show that say well sure jesus probably committed a few sins listen if jesus committed one sin you are doomed for all eternity Amen. your whole eternal salvation rests on the belief that jesus committed not one sin that he was sinless and perfect and so at the end of his sinless and perfect life Jesus offered to die for our sins, the just for the unjust. The Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us. He became sin on the cross so that we could become the righteousness of God. Because of the work of Jesus Christ, there's now a second book. Every, in the library of heaven, there's a book of Dave Miller and you never get to read it. 
But if God reads that book and looks at my life, he says, no, Dave, sorry. Don't worry, there's a book of you, too. Not, not the rock band, but you got a book as well. And your book will cost you eternity as well. But because of Jesus Christ, there's a second book. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And the names of those who trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, those who are born again into a new life, into the family of God, their names go into the second book, the book of life. Since we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we all fail when the first book is opened. And the only question that really matters, we all share one common experience. When our book is opened, we fall short. Guilty. Guilty. Oh, Mac? Guilty. Guess what, folks? Even Leah May. Marilyn? Guilty. Tom? Ooh. And, and Beverly was a lot better before she married Tom, but now, <laughs> guilty. And I could go through, we're all guilty. Amen. Billy Graham, guilty. Mother Teresa, guilty. You name it, guilty. From the worst dregs of humanity to the most, to the nicest, best people you know are when our book is open before God, we're guilty. And so the only question that remains is, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Now, I believe that I'm going to heaven, but I would not pass the book one test. If God reviewed that book, I would hear those horrible words, depart from me. But that will never happen because Jesus held my book next to him on the cross. He held that book and received all of God's wrath for my sins on Himself. Every sin I committed, Jesus paid for. And my Jesus had a book-burning session on the cross. I'm not all in favor of book-burning, but my book got burned at the cross. Has that happened to you? Have you trusted Christ? I have the hope of heaven because Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Because my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. I have a hope of heaven because there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. My book got blotted out. And when the Father, the Father doesn't have my book anymore. Because Jesus took it to the cross and burned it. Amen. By His grace, my name is in the book of life, not death. Now in the complicated system of resurrections and judgments, I think that those who go to the great white throne judgment, there'll be lost people raised at the very end to face eternal damnation. I think those of us who are redeemed will already have been raised and glorified. So the only people left to be judged at this horrible moment are the wicked dead, those who have died and rejected Christ. Can't be sure of this, but it seems likely that those who were at this great white throne are those who are facing eternal separation from God. It is a dark and terrible moment. Now, I've joked kind of about gleefully rejoicing as Satan is cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. I think that will be a moment of rejoicing. I think it'll be a moment of glee when we see Satan cast forever into the lake of fire. But there will be a different mood when men and women are condemned to eternal death. The fire was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for people 
created in the image of God. They are only there because they resisted every gracious effort of God to bring them to eternal salvation. When God gave His Son to this world, people crucified Him. When the Holy Spirit was sent into the world, people suppressed His truth and they scoffed. Every loving work of God to display His grace, to show His mercy, to pour out His love on this wicked world has gone unheeded and people have hardened their hearts against God. The Bible says there is a narrow road that leads to eternal life. But people have instead chosen the wide road that leads to destruction. And most people have chosen the wide road. And on that day, when people stand before the great white throne, all hope is gone. Today, people deny God's judgment and they make excuses. Oh, God is too loving to judge sinners, to send people to hell. I'm not that bad. I'm better than other people. Maybe scoundrels and drug dealers and abusers and perverts deserve hell, but I'm a good citizen. I've got a family. I work hard. I go to church sometimes. Why would God send me to hell? But on that day, there will be no excuses. The first book will be opened and people's works will be exposed. Even the thoughts and intents of their hearts will be exposed. And standing in the presence of a holy God, shining the light of His Shekinah glory on them, everyone will understand that they have fallen short of the glory of God, stripped bare of their hubris. They will bow their heads in guilt. And their only hope will be that their names are written in the book of life. And listen, here, I want to make it clear, folks. You don't get your name in the book of life by joining the church, by getting baptized, by taking communion, by being a church member, by being a good member of the community, or by voting. There's one way. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Your name only goes in the book when you trust Jesus as your Savior and Lord. That is the only hope that anyone will have on that day. The only hope any of us have is that we believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think there will be an ominous sadness as we stand there and watch people being declared guilty. I think we will rejoice when Satan and all of his angels are cast into the lake. But there will be no joy when we watch people, maybe people that we knew and perhaps loved, cast. No one will question the righteousness of God, that He is just and fair and good. But it was so unnecessary. I remember a young man, and I don't have lost touch with him. It's been, gracious, 35, 40 years. But he was in my youth group, and I know that this young man resisted the gospel, raised in a Christian home. He heard my dad preach the gospel Sunday after Sunday. He heard me preach the gospel Sunday after uh, Wednesday night after Wednesday night at youth retreats and time after time. And I remember one time I was proclaiming the gospel at a youth rally, and I could see that Mark was struggling. I could see him, that he was under conviction but I could also see that he did not respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he he resisted. And I don't know what's happened to him since. You know, he may be serving the Lord somewhere, but last I knew he was not. And I just, it, it was so unnecessary. He heard the gospel time and time and time again. God created us for him, not for hell. It is not God's will that any should perish. And only by rejecting Jesus do people end up there. And we'll watch some of history's most horrible people stand before God and face condemnation. Hitler and Saddam and Osama and Nero will be judged along with criminals and abusers and the dregs of history. But more shocking 
if the Bible is to believe, then I believe the Bible, there will be good people, church people, even church leaders. They were in the pew every Sunday, but Jesus was never in their hearts. Perhaps the most disturbing verse in the Bible to me is Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. You know that verse? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and do mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. People will say, we did miracles. We cast out demons. We preached in your name, prophesied in your name, preachers and deacons and church elders, people who did miracles in the name of Jesus. And Jesus stands there and says, I never knew you. Depart from me. Listen, you can sleep in a doghouse. It doesn't make you a dog. You can sit in a church. It doesn't make you a Christian. It is God's grace. It is admitting to God that the book of your works isn't good enough to get you into heaven. And repenting of your sins and trusting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It is Christ and Christ alone. His mercy, His grace. May your name be written in the book of life. Is your name written in the book of life? Of course you're in church. Duh. You wouldn't be here today if you weren't in church, right? That's the most profound statement you'll ever hear. But it's not enough to be in church. You've got to be in Christ. And I find that to be the hardest thing to articulate. In all my ministry, the difference between being in Christ and being in church. And my fear is that one day I will stand at the great white throne judgment and watch people that I've pastored, people who sat in my sermons, faithful members of my churches, perhaps co-laborers in gospel work, stand before the throne and hear those words depart from me into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And I'll be... had a professor in seminary say there's going to be two things that surprise us in heaven them that's there and them that ain't. You're going to be surprised when you see some of the people that are in heaven with you. Do you know some of the most notorious mass murderers of our generation have trusted Christ? By every definition, they're going to be in heaven because your sins are not, the, the extent of your sins are not what matter in terms of getting to heaven, but whether or not you've trusted Christ. Some of the worst people, I could name them, but I'm not going to do that. But some of the worst names of the last 50 years trusted Christ in prison. And by every, every evidence I have, I will see them in heaven. But there are going to be people that we think are the most noble, wonderful. Let me tell you a story about Sandy. I don't have time, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sandy was the best kid in my youth group. Saw Sandy at the convention this year. Sandy was the best kid in my youth group, junior, senior year, just hardworking, sweet, wonderful girl. And she went away to college. She went away to the University of Florida. And she came back. And she asked my dad, who was a senior pastor, she says, uh, Pastor, can I, can I speak for just a few minutes at church? My dad's like, okay. He was confused. 
She'd gone, she'd gone away, gotten involved in Baptist campus ministries there. And she got up and she says, I want to tell you about something that happened to me my first semester at University of Florida. I got saved. Listen, if Sandy had died as a senior in high school, I guarantee you we'd have preached her the best Christian funeral we could have. She was the best Christian girl I knew in my youth group. The only problem was she'd never been saved. She was a great Christian. Problem was she wasn't a Christian. She went away to college and she met Jesus. I don't know how, I don't know how it happened. But we let this wonderful Christian girl slip through our fingers. And she never met Christ till she got to college. Being part of a church doesn't make you part of God's family. And I don't, I don't know how to articulate this, and it, it haunts me. Because it's trusting Jesus Christ. Not sitting in a church pew. And I'm not here to make you question your salvation. But I'm here to tell you if the Holy Spirit's doing it, don't say, well, I've been in church for 57 years. The question I would ask you to think about today. <clears throat> one book is absolutely clear. Book one, you and you and you and you and you, I'm not supposed to point fingers, so that's why preachers point with their knuckles. You and you and you and you and you and you and you. We all fail book one. Is your name in book two? Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Are you a church person or are you a Christ person? Because being a church person never saved anyone. It made people feel good, but it never saved anyone. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Is your name written in the only book that matters for all eternity? The Lamb's Book of Life. Father in heaven, I pray that every single person here, I know that most of these people have settled that issue long ago, have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But I pray that if there is anyone here who is a church person, not a Christ person, I pray that you would save a soul today that every one of us here would trust Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord before we leave this place. In Jesus' wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen.